copy of it. And before we get into our discussion, I'm going to pass it off to Nora Nagel, one of our TAG's co-chairs, to share an update regarding the topic of our last meeting on Uber and Lyft service animal refusals. Nora, take it away. Hi, everybody. Thank you for coming tonight. My name is Nora Nagel. I'm one of the co-chairs of the RTAG Executive Board. And as many of you may know, last month, RTAG, the Boston Center for Independent Living, the Bay State Council for the Blind, all hosted a public forum on rideshare refusals of service animal users. Um, almost 100 community members participated there were representatives from Uber, from Lyft, from the MBTA, from the ride. Um, and the community members at the meeting requested the following from the rideshare companies. Um, first, that the MBTA, Uber, and Lyft representatives, through monitoring and effective discipline, ensure that no more driver denials of service animal users occur. Uh, second, that sharing driver deactivations between Uber and Lyft platforms so that people can't bounce back and forth from one to the other um, was requested. Third, sharing transparent data about the number of rider refusals, how drivers are warned, how many warnings, and any other disciplinary action taken. And lastly, requested updates on the progress and results of the community's actions. Our tag is continuing the conversation with the MBTA, Uber and Lyft representatives, as well as the Rideshare Drivers Union. We'll continue to update members with upcoming meetings and advocacy efforts. And as a reminder, there is a working group that meets on this service animal refusal issue. And if any of you are interested in joining, please send our tag an email at rtagboston at bostoncil.org. And we'll put that email address in the chat. And I'll give it back to Kat. Sounds good. Thank you so much, Nora. And I know that I did not ask either side to have anything prepared. But before we begin our general discussion, Laura, can I put you on the spot if you want to say anything on behalf of the MBTA? Uh, absolutely. Thank God. Um... So very quickly, just want to thank uh, Kat, you and the executive board for the invitation to join you all tonight to listen to hear everyone's feedback regarding their experiences with navigating the MBTA uh, during the winter time, specifically after a snow or ice storm. Uh, we recognize that snow and ice is one of the biggest barriers to accessibility that we often face, um, particularly during the winter. And this is something we talk a lot about internally. Um, just by way of a quick overview, uh, the MBTA for folks awareness around policies and protocols, the MBTA is directly responsible for moving all snow and ice from our property. So all of our stations, many of our major busways, um, and all of our facilities on any other facility on MBTA property, we directly oversee either through staff or through contractors, snow and ice removal at, the, at those locations. When it comes to bus stops, um, as I think most folks know, the vast majority of MBTA bus stops are located on municipal sidewalks. Uh, and our snow and ice removal is the uh, responsibility of the city and town or property, private property owner. Um, however, about a decade ago, the T elected to begin shoveling snow and ice from stops along our 15 highest ridership, ridership routes, what we refer to as our key routes. So today the T will shovel, will shovel um, each of those key routes immediately following a storm that, that accounts for about 700 stops. But we rely on the municipalities to 
clear snow and ice from all of the other stops. Uh, we are actively uh, collaborating with cities and towns uh, in advance of each winter to just discuss and remind everyone about the criticality of good snow and ice removal at bus stops. Uh, in fact, we just had a meeting a couple weeks ago where many city and town representatives joined us to have a conversation about this very topic. Um, and I should mention one thing that is the requirement of all of our contractors and that we, you know, we've been talking about a lot with the, our municipal, municipal partners is when snow and ice is cleared, that we're make sure, making sure we provide an accessible path so that our paths that are being shoveled are wide enough, typically five foot wide, for everyone to pass through. And that we're removing snow from bus stops in a way that allows the ramp to be fully deployed. So happy to answer any questions that come up about our policies and who does what today, but more importantly, uh, a number of my colleagues and your colleagues and I are here just to listen, to figure out ways that we can keep doing a better job at this. And I will say, I believe our general manager is on his way and will be joining us to hear feedback in a few minutes as well. Great, thank you so okay. much, Laura. And Francisco, is there anything you'd like to share on behalf of MassDOT before we begin our discussion? Um, thank you, Kat. Uh, good evening to everyone in the meeting. Um, the complete service engineer for the Department of Transportation, Massachusetts. Um, as you all know, there is a commitment from the department to improve our facilities where we provide a space for everybody, um, not just more vehicles. Uh, we are consistently doing, uh, working on projects and having conversations like that. And uh, we're having also conversations with our uh, district offices to perform snow and ice operations. I believe that we have our uh, statewide of snow and ice operations. Kat, in, in the room, he might be able to uh, provide a little more information on the specifics of what we do for um, keeping the areas accessible at all times. Great, thank you, Francisco. And if that person is in the room, do you mind unmuting yourself? And if hey, Wilson, not. can you hear me? I was Wilson and uh, my, uh, the earphones are cutting in out. Oh, no worries, we can hear you. Great. Uh, I'm Moscow, Chief of Maintenance for uh, Master Highway Division, uh, where, you know, Master Highway handles uh, all of the snow and ice and all. Um, uh, MassDOT uh, own roadways and facilities and, um, you know, we coordinate with um, municipalities when there's, uh, you know, issues on, you know, who's responsible for clean, you know, taking care of a uh, roadway or sidewalk. But our intent is to, you know, is uh, focused on making sure everything's accessible for folks. Great. Thank you, Scott. And thank you, Francisco. So we are now ready to begin our question and discussion period. To indicate that you have a question, please use the Zoom's raise hand feature. When you raise your hand, it alerts the moderator that you'd like to speak. The moderator will unmute attendees to ask questions in the order that they raise their hands. When called upon, introduce yourself briefly. Please try and keep your response to two to three minutes and focus on an example related to the topic of snow removal and municipal coordination. We want to hear from as many people as possible. Please share one piece of feedback. And if there's time after everyone with their raised hand has shared, you can share again. All right, Susie, I'm going to start with you. Okay, thanks, Kat. Um, I'm, uh... I'm Susie Backstrom. I'm the disability. Uh, I'm a disability peer advocate at Boston Center for Independent Living, and I'm also the Chelsea, one of the Chelsea Disability Commissioners. And um, I just think that that um, you know that this this is really important because because as as you know as sometimes like a municipality will do a good job plow, plowing a road 
but they will plow it into the curb cut and, and into the into the 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 way of a bus stop. And so even with the ramp or whatever, it comes down, it's still not not uh, all the way onto dry or dry-ish pavement anyway. And so, I mean, it's just, it's uh, it, like, like there has to be a sort of a coordination between, um, between the, the plowing and the shoveling and, you know, curb cut and, and the bus stop that where the bus would actually would actually open the door and put down a ramp or open a door to people with a with a, a cane or crutches or or a walker or whatever so these are these are the these are my concerns and um i mean i have i've um with with Mastot and and you know with Chelsea, we struggled all the we struggle all the time with this because, you know, I heard I heard all sorts of uh, feedback from residents who use wheelchairs and who were unable to get to bus stops to even go to the store, and some people were like basically stuck for up to even a month or more because of the way the, the plowing and the shoveling went. And, and it's just, and, and some, sometimes those private, those private contractors are not even thinking about this stuff. And so they will plow and, and they'll, they'll form these ice berms. And, and those are nearly impossible to, to uh, scale, you know, and it's just, it's just hard. It's just the the winter is super difficult. I just want you know a, a focus to be on on making sure that this uh, that that these sort of intersections between private plow, public plow, private shoveler, public shoveler, MBTA shoveler, MBTA plow, all of those. Those need to be coordinated, and if and if somebody's like falling down on the job, somebody else needs to to pick up the slack. That's me. Thanks, Susie. <clears throat> Jennifer, you are next. Hi, uh, am I muted? Can you, you hear me? Or not? We can okay, hear you. Great. Um, is there a number that we can call if there are uh, and or a website? preferably a number to call to complain about these curb sites and the on and the ramps to get on the sidewalks because it's so dangerous walking with a cane trying to navigate over slippery snow especially when the uh, sidewalk cut is right there at a store or a building you know there's a store where the bus stop is and they say it's not their job, and it, this, that sidewalk ramp never gets shoveled, and or it's slippery, and that's te so tetri petrifying. Is there a number or a way that someone could put in a link for the uh, MBTA that we can contact someone to let them know someone needs to get there immediately to clear that and or throw rock salt down or something of that nature? That's my question. Thank you. Laura, I'm gonna call on you. Do you have an answer to this? So I think this is gonna be a somewhat unsatisfying answer, but it really depends on the location of that curb ramp or that unshoveled location. Um, again, if that is anywhere on MBTA property. Absolutely. Once we receive that information, and I'll give you the contact information in a second. Okay. We would dispatch someone out there to 
remove that snow and ice. Um, if it had piled up after it had been shoveled originally. If, however, it's on the property of um, city or town property, we would refer you back to the city and town to raise the issue. Um, Mara, question, how many feet is considered from the bus, from the bus stop to the curb or the ramp, is that considered uh, MBTA property? Because it's literally on the corner of two streets, that ramp mm -hmm. entrance to get on the sidewalk. So, so generally, the vast majority <laughs> of our nearly 7,000 bus stops, uh -huh. the vast majority of them are always on a gay city, city sidewalk or sidewalk that's privately, privately owned. So from that point of view, you're, you're always engaging with the city with the exception of the stops located on our key bus routes. Uh, and I'm going to ask one of my colleagues if they could drop the list of what the key bus routes are in the chat. There are 15 bus routes uh, at which the MBTA has a contract to have the snow removed. Okay. And what that means is we're out at those bus stops. There are about 700 of them. What we will do is the contractor will go in and remove snow from the front, what we call the landing pad, which is where the front doors of the bus line up. Right. They will clear snow from that front landing pad. They will cut the snow. They will cut a pathway in between the snow that piles up between the sidewalk and the roadway so that the ramp can deploy. And they will make a connection from that cutout in the landing pad to the back of the sidewalk. But they, mm -hmm. it's important to note that even in, when we clear those stops, yep. the contractor will not be clearing a pathway from the bus stop all the way to the closest curb ramp. It's really just making sure that the front landing pad is clear, that the uh, ramp can be deployed, and that we're connecting back to the sidewalk. Again, the, the connection to the curb ramp would be the responsibility of the city and town, city or town. Jennifer, can you share which specific location you were talking about again? I, I am talking about the corner of Wombach and Warren Street. To get to the bus stop, you have to go onto a ramp. And yes, they can clear the path for the ramp to come down, but it's just getting to that path where the ramp comes. It can be so slippery or just that's where they'll pile up snow sometimes. And it's like you have to be skinny and like squeeze through those ramp paths sometimes I've seen. Oh, gosh. And, and that's, it's and so that's skinny. in Roxbury, right? Yes, ma'am. Yes, okay. ma'am. Great, thank you so much for sharing, Jennifer. Thank you for asking. Laura, I, oh, this, go for so it. Lane, hi, I just wanna say what we'll try to do is we will work with the municipalities when we do get these reports and try to make calls on behalf of the individual requests as, as we can, um, trying to be as supportive and, and facilitating as possible, understanding that um, jurisdictional boundaries may be unclear to folks. We will try to assist as best as we can. Thank you and so that's much, what GM. We need to be clear of whose jurisdiction is it. That's okay, right. Uh, this is Andrew with the city of Boston. Would it be helpful for me to talk a little bit about the city of Boston's snow ordinance? Absolutely. Before it. Great. So in the city of Boston, the responsibility for sidewalk clearance uh, per or ordinance is on the property owner that abuts that sidewalk. So whether that is a residential home, um, a storefront, uh, even a city of Boston property, um, you're responsible to clear the snow that abuts your property. So like I am responsible to clear the sidewalk that is in front of my, my home. If that building is on a corner, you are also responsible uh, to clear that curb ramp. So you can always, if there's an un 
shoveled or an icy curb ramp in yep. the city of Boston, you can report it to 311. You can call 311, email them, uh, or use the app if you can take a picture of it and send it to 311. Uh, the city will then send code enforcement out uh, and will write a ticket uh, to the relevant property owner if they haven't cleared their snow. You just made me so happy saying that. Oh my goodness, because I'm a pitcher queen. Oh yes, 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 yes. This is super. Thank you so much. And now question two, <laughs> how far is it between the store front sidewalk to the say uh, mailbox that's on the corner? Would that be still considered the storefront property? Because I know I'm gonna I'm gonna run to a lot of backlash with that, but I want to be able to explain, you know, the ordinance to them as well. Yep. So um, you the folks are required to shovel a uh, 42 inch wide path of travel along the linear front of it, right? Okay. Along the, if you're walking along the sidewalk, heading down the street or rolling along the sidewalk, heading yeah. down the street, there should be a 42 inch wide path of travel that is cleared. Yeah. If you're a corner building, uh -huh. that curb ramp um, uh -huh. is also your responsibility. There should be a path to the tactile warning, that tactile warning should have been salted um, so that it is not um, slippery. Uh, so that people can traverse down into the crosswalk. Now, I know that this can be difficult because plows sometimes do push snow, you know, yeah. into that corner. And so the city does always message to property owners that you may have to clear the ramp a few times after a snow falls, um, right. but they will get a ticket uh, if they're not keeping it clear. You're the best. You're the best. Thank you so much. Thank you, Andrea and Jennifer. I am going to just ask a chat question directed towards Laura from Abby Swain. Laura, can you tell us more about the recent meeting with DPW staff about cooperation on removing snow from bus stops? Did most MBTA communities attend and what issues were raised? Some of which audience members could work locally to resolve? Sure, let me ask, I believe we've got Angel Dunahue with us, whose team coordinated that meeting. Angel, if you're on, would you like to speak with us? Um, or Kapanesh, who oversees our operations plan and scheduling meeting, they both were key presenters. All right, what I what I can share is oh, I think they're ahead. both available. No, sorry, I'm always I realize Zoom sometimes the video doesn't show up to see yourself. So just being sure. Uh, I'm I'm happy to give some comments. I think we have Angel on too, Laura. Um so this meeting, uh Laura has been really making sure that we've had, I think now for several years. Uh, we've been sending out uh, the letter from the GM since I think 2017, and then a few years ago kicked off a planning level meeting with all the local DPWs. Originally, it was intended for all of our cities, the 50 plus cities and towns that are uh, served by our bus routes. And then last year, we expanded it to actually include the over 170 cities and towns that are impacted at all uh, by the team service area, also including commuter rail, as grade crossings of uh, commuter rail is also a key component of snow removal. Um, in years past, I think it's really been as the issues that folks have raised, um, making sure there's clarity about who is responsible for what. But I think as, as, as the last speaker really hit on the head of making sure that constituents know who to go to um, if they're having issues. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think one of the most interesting ideas that was raised actually by the city of Cambridge was trying to give city of Cambridge and other towns better information to push out um, to help understand what good bus stop clearing looks like um, as what when it is the responsibility of the abutter uh, as well as uh, shelter clearing as well as I don't know if Laura got to that but that's a slightly different issue as well but also very important to us for the 650 bus shelters we have in the system but I think we have pretty good attendance there's over 50 people there I want to say probably about 10 to 20 different cities and towns and, and it was accompanied also by a letter that our, our GM sent out to all to all municipalities that are in our service area but let me toss it over to Angel to see. As I know, you were you were running the show, Angel. 
Hmm. Yeah. So we can, for look, can everyone hear me? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Um, thanks. Thanks, Kat. Yeah. So we um, are making a huge effort um, in the organization to really improve um, our municipal engagement, um, particularly around understanding what our what their responsibilities are between the T or on bus stops um, uh, and other municipalities. Um, and we recognize the importance of that. Um, and we will be hiring a, a new director of government affairs that's going to help manage and oversee the um, the municipal engagement draft plan that I think many of you have seen. Um, we have narrowed down on an individual that we believe will be beginning will be starting um, in early January. Uh, and this person is going to be really focused, um, along with other folks on my team, on making sure that we have those types of engagement with municipalities, specifically the DPW directors that are going to be out there on the front lines, directing those folks, making sure that the snow is really cleared. So um, you'll be seeing uh, regular updates from those folks, um, uh, I imagine, in the future. And I'm, the next time we do an RTAG meeting, I'll make sure that that new individual who will be here um, is present in, in, in his as he gets himself up to speed. Great, thank you so much, Kat and Angel. I'm gonna go back to the Zoom. Jill, you are next. Hi, um, my name is Jill. I live in Quincy and I work in Woburn. Um, I take the tea the whole way, it's an adventure. It's actually um, four different modes of transportation. And there are three places along there that are, are pretty tricky to navigate in the winter. Um, the first one on that trip is, is Ashmont Station, actually the busway itself, um, where the bus is left, let off in, in the entrance to the station. It's often not cleared in the morning. Um, sometimes it's still not cleared in the <coughs> afternoon. It was particularly noticeable last winter. I actually fell at the station um, on the ice. Um, the second place is at Government Center, um, outside the station where the 354 bus picks up. I've actually stopped boarding there and, and, and started walking down to State Street Station because it's so bad over there. Um, it's uh, up where the bus stops. So it's it's not particularly clear. Um, there's often vehicles parked in the bus stop, uh, usually large trucks that make it worse, um, and in vehicles parked on the sidewalk outside the station, including MBTA vehicles, um, which which make it actually extra challenge to navigate. Um, it, it pedals too, so that that's an extra challenge. Um, and then the third place is, is up in Woburn, um, um, uh, where the um, 95, the route or the on-ramp to 93 is. Um, it, it's, it's just a bus stop. It's, it's on the sidewalk. Um, I've contacted the city of Woburn. It's, it's typically the sidewalk is not cleared. And they've actually told me it's state property. So it needs to be cleared by the state. Um, and um, it's pretty dangerous actually to get off there when it's not cleared because it's it's um, about three lanes of traffic each way, very fast moving. Um, um, and kind of a, in addition to the, the snow and ice itself, um, I think the, the extra challenge is um, the bus drivers who are not very accommodating. Um, they're, they're not very, they, they often will just let you off into a snow bank and refuse to move forward. And if you ask them to move forward or move back or to lower, lower the bus, they'll close the doors and go to the next stop. Um, so it's there, the drivers themselves are not particularly accommodating along that, that route. Um, the same thing going back on the 354 when it stops at State Street Station, the bus drivers are, uh, along that route are particularly not accommodating. Thanks. Thank you so much for sharing, Jill. Nora, you are next. I I wanted to follow up on the um, city of Boston ordinance questions. Um, if you could, it, I, I'm sorry, her name is escaping me, but if you could clarify the responsibility of a butters clearing sidewalks, what I didn't hear was, you know, I, they're clearly supposed to um, make a clear path of travel and take care of things like curb cuts and fire hydrants. But particularly in the city of Boston, many bus stops are along city blocks where you get on and off buses does not align with a curb cut on a corner. Um, I'm thinking of stops like a South Station, for example, where there's a bus stop literally in the middle of the block um, or 
Otis and Summer Street, where multiple bus buses are stopping. Um, same by, is it High Street uh, or Federal? Um, it's along those same routes. But these, you know, you could, the abutters could, you know, have an immaculate sidewalk in front of their building. And the result of their immaculate cleaning of the sidewalk in front of their building is a three foot snowbank separating the street from the sidewalk. And as the previous speaker mentioned, drivers are gonna let you off where they're able to let you off. Um, we've talked extensively in, in other meetings about the fact that double parking, delivery vehicles, all sorts of um, other obstacles in bus stops pre can prevent bus drivers from pulling completely into stops or pulling up to the appropriate drop-off spot. And having a butters just clear the sidewalks doesn't solve the problem of MBTA bus riders getting from the bus onto that sidewalk. You know, I can tell you I've watched people in their 80s with walkers trying to scramble over snow banks and being helped by you know three and four people to get, to haul them over a snow bank to get them onto a sidewalk once they get off a bus it's appalling that should not happen and ultimately the cost is people who ha have this whole fixed route system made inaccessible to them due to the weather are going to go to the ride which is a much more expensive proposition in the long run, clearing these bus stops is a cost-saving measure because it allows people to avoid using paratransit. And believe me, you know, and I'm sure other people on this call would say the same, the flexibility of the fixed route system is what would be my preferred mode of travel. But when that is made completely inaccessible to me, I don't have a choice rather than go to the paratransit system, which then raises the cost for the entire system. So I don't know what can be done about I have making a butters understand their responsibilities with clearing spots specifically for people to get on and off buses, for buses to be able to safely deploy ramps, that sort of thing. Thanks. Hey, Nora, this is, oh, sorry, Kat, I was gonna go for it. The city. Okay. Thanks. Um, this is Andrea um, with the City's Disabilities Commission. Um, I completely understand the, the situation that you're describing here. Um, we, I think we as the city can certainly do better at discussing and, and communicating to abutters the need to sort of punch a path through the, the snowbank. Part of the challenge, my understanding, is that that is not explicitly laid out in the ordinance as a requirement. And so it's, it is a harder thing to um, encourage and require. Um, that said, the places that you're describing right now, those mid-block places that aren't maybe near a curb ramp that is clarified in the ordinance, um, you know, are budding really big commercial uh, buildings. Um, so it, it they probably have on staff, you know, contracts with folks to clear outside those buildings. Uh, those should be, you know, easier places to get started than maybe trying to communicate it to an individual property owner who doesn't talk to the city as often. So I took down the notes of the, the places that you're, you mentioned over at South Station um, and High Street uh, to, uh, and Otis and Summer to um, maybe do some proactive outreach specifically to those abutters um, to, to chat with them before the winter. So I will follow up with our public works department um, and see, because I know their code enforcement team does do some proactive outreach to, to major major properties. So um, I'll get in touch with them. Thank wow, you. though, that's a, that's a re revelatory piece of information that, that the requirement to make those bus stops accessible to clear a path from their clear path of travel that they're responsible for creating to a to the through a bus stop is not their responsibility according to the ordinance that's a piece of information i don't think most of us have heard before and i haven't read the ordinance that? in a while but it is um it, it's pretty old it's been in in place for a while and and i don't believe at the time it was created 
um, that access to bus stops was was considered, quite frankly. Um, so I, I mean, I'll have to triple check and can reread the ordinance, but I don't believe bus stops are called out in the ordinance. No, I, I can check though and follow up with Kat to report back at your next meeting. Is that you, something, Nora. now I'm just asking the question out loud, is, is that gonna be the situation in almost every city in town? And is that why the confusion exists? Because there actually doesn't appear to be any requirement for them to do it. Andrew, do you know if that if the ordinance is something that can be re-examined or reopened and edited? I don't see why not. It's not a home rule petition. It would it would tip be an ordinance by city council if they wish to update it. Um, Okay. Is that something that the commissioner would be willing to propose? We can't propose legislation. Um, a city councilor would have to propose it um, or the mayor. Okay, we'll definitely follow up on that. Thanks, Andrea and Nora. Um, I'm going to quickly go to a chat question from Abby. In Boston and in other cities and towns that Kat Banesh may be able to speak to, who enforces the snow removal ordinance? Brookline recently upgraded our snow removal bylaw to short the compliance window, to shorten the compliance window and include curb cuts, but enforcement responsibility is divided by zones. And in general, unfilled municipal jobs are getting in the way of both enforcement and backup. Is there anyone to speak to that? I know Abby named me. I think Andrea might, or some of the cities might be better to take me a step back, right? So if it's raise the T's attention and it is our proper responsibility, because it's one of the key bus routes to the Silver Line, we will get out there and cleared, right? It's it's done by our contractors. We have service level agreements. They need to be cleared. If they're not cleared, we will go back out until they are cleared. Um, if it is not ours, uh, and I think, as the general manager said, um, I think we want to do a better job of following the cities and towns to let them know about complaints and issues constituents are having. But in terms of actual enforcement, the T does not have the right or ability. If someone jumped in, that's wrong, but to actually do enforcement with any fines or citations. I believe that is squarely in the powers of the municipalities and towns. Thanks, Kat. Question, Jennifer Smith Workman. Bus stops that are on a, a vacant lot of uh, property, <clears throat> there's no building there. And uh, 10 feet or 20 feet away, the post office is, is there. And you get off the bus, you can't get there. Who's, who do you call to clear that path to get from the bus stop to the post office, which is, again, 10 to 20 feet away from the bus stop? Is that the municipality? Hi, Jennifer. Again, if you're talking Roxbury, um, even if there's no building there, someone owns that property, okay. and the owner of that property does have maintenance responsibilities, including to clear the sidewalk. So the city would write an assessment against the the or a, a would write a violation and a fine against the owner of that property if they don't clear the snow. Great, thanks, so Andrea. Uh, this, this is Nora with a quick question. Could you give us a sense as to what that files that fine structure is like? Is it, you know, what's the baseline fine? Is it escalating for each additional violation? Um, just some idea of what the penalty actually is. Yep, it depends on the uh, kind of property. So it's $50 violation for residential um, violations and 100 for, um, sorry, it's uh, 150, I wanna say for commercial. Um, and every day that it is not cleared is considered a separate violation. Thanks for sharing. I am going to move on to Tom. And you are currently muted. Hi, uh, this is Tom here. Um, I, 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 have, I have a question um, with, with, in regards to snow removal in general. As uh, the surrounding city has been paying attention to what Somerville has been doing, um, I actually myself brought it to their attention years and years ago when I started digging out my own bus stop with my shovel. And, and I kind of, I think I caught the attention of DPW on, on this very issue. 
um, this, this, what the city of Somerville does when you have snow banks that are built up in the different, on the various different bus stops, you know, that, 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 that are not T property. Um, usually when the storm is over, the, uh, the, the, the their practice is, 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 is to have a, a, a backhoe come around and, and actually, and actually scoop the, uh, the, the, the snow bank, the, the 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 whole snow bank out of the bus stop. Like whether the, if the bus stop is like twenty feet, forty feet, sixty feet long, the the city of Somerville will, will actually scoop the uh, bus the, the snow bank bank completely out. So 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 the curb in the street is uh, is free of snow, and and it gets put into a dump truck and it gets taken to a, a snow farm. And um, they they this they probably have been 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 doing that for for the last maybe. Maybe five or six years now, as 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 a as as, as common practice. So so I, so I have to give kudos as far as DPW or what some of those doing here, what or what a lot of other municipalities are not doing now, especially Braintree and Arlington, and um, you know the ones who I'd like to really you know, <laughs> real I really I really get angry about. It. So, so doesn't Joanne because she lives in Brain in Braintree and. They don't. They don't seem to get it yet. But if anybody's been paying attention to DPW and Somerville of of, uh, of what we're doing here, thanks, Tom. Joanne, you are up next. And I hope you can get that picture up. I'm Joanne Daniel Spangold. I live in Braintree on the Holbrook Line. My bus route is a 230, and it runs on Washington Street, also known as State Route 37. Um, our, that's my bus shelter. Wow. That, picture, that picture was taken, I believe in 2015, um, after several days of calling um, Braintree Town Hall, asking to have it cleaned out. I know that this bus shelter is a responsibility of DPW. And according to what is said in the, in uh, the regulations, they are to clean out the bus stop, clean out rather the, the uh, bus shelter. In this case, um, if you could see it a little bit better, they did exactly that. They cleared out the bus stop. They left no path of travel to the bus stop or from the bus stop to the street. And I think they thought this was funny. This is an annual thing. I'm a wheelchair user. I have my own my own snow shovel. I live in Branky Three Highlands, as I said, on the Holbrook Line. My friend Crystal Evans lives in South Braintree Square area, and she has her own but uh, her own snow shovel, she, she's a wheelchair user. She also has a ventilator on the back of her wheelchair. Okay, this woman has some serious health issues. I do too. And my shoulder's not happy about, do, about shoveling my side, the side of the street that does have a, doesn't have a bus shelter. I have no choice. People in my neighborhood, this neighborhood is considered rural. They clear basically a path from the street to their, to their mailbox and ignore what's in front of their house. I mean, that, that gets their, their, their mail delivered and that's about it. Um, there are also problems that municipalities cause with regard to uh, placing um, bus bike racks, um, planters, other objects in and around, like in front of or on the path to uh, bus stops. Uh, they don't always connect with the team with regard to um, any construction that's going to be happening in advance. All of these things are, are barriers to transportation, not just for people with disabilities, but you know, if there's going to be a hole in front of your bus stop, there's nobody can get there. So th these are issues that need to be addressed. And the only thing I, the only thing I can see happening is that that there are become some sort of cooperation with stakeholders municipalities and others in order to I mean, it's, let's, we live in new england the snow's not going away uh, we can have all the global warming we want we're still going to have pictures like my um my bus stop um uh, there has to be something and i know we've got ordinances regarding snow removal as far as um residential areas they may say all they want, oh, well, Route 37 is a state highway, but it's a residential road, uh, bottom line, so. Thanks, Joanne. I am going to quickly hop to the chat and share two comments. One from Nora Nagel saying, $150 for a commercial property owner is ridiculously low. 
If the fines are not paid, what is the mechanism for enforcement? And Holly Simone, the Chair Disability Commissioner of Somerville, shared, thank you, Tom, for talking about Somerville. When the big blizzard from years ago happened, the city purchased a $1 million machine that melted the snow and ice with hot water, worth every penny. We have lots of opportunities to improve accessibility in Somerville, but I appreciate your feedback. Thank you. I am going to call on Dennis to go next. All right, thank you very much, Ken. A uh, couple of items. Um, item one, uh, it seems uh, if one is to believe everything you read in social media, uh, one of the things that's happening, at least in Boston, is that property owners are foisting the responsibility of shoveling to their tenants, basically writing into their lease sometimes that says, you are the tenant, you are the occupant, therefore you must be doing the shoveling in the winter. Uh, in those instances where uh, these people know better and know what the law is, uh, the landlord gets a fine and then he takes that amount off of the security deposit. And by the end of your occupancy, you have no money in the security deposit fund. Uh, a lot of people moving to Boston are not aware of this. Uh, they don't know the law, and of course, there are some unscrupulous landlords that are going to try to get away with this. So um, along with the physical action to get things uh, straightened out here and to get uh, shoveling done, there is a major education process that uh, all of the cities and towns are going to have to do that says the owner of the property, and I'm a property owner, uh, is responsible for shoveling and making sure that it is passable. Item two, uh, which I wanted to uh, bring up, is that uh, last year, again, reading my neighborhood association uh, messages and social media, uh, it seems that people like ourselves who did not get outside and shovel within the specified amount of time were getting complaints from their neighbors that their sidewalk was not shoveled, uh, well, the corner was not shoveled, and they were getting cited by the various municipalities. I happened to be in Boston. Uh, in many cases, uh, charitable neighbors took over and went over and shoveled these people out. Uh, but that is something that is not part of the process, a way to identify who is the scoff law and who is a senior that's unable to do this or a disabled person or maybe their uh, contracted shoveler did not show up for whatever reason within the amount of time. I mean, we only have a couple of days to get this done after the snow stops. And sometimes these people that shovel things out overbook themselves. They may not get to you for a couple of days. And so I think that's something to toss into the mix. Education and maybe some, uh, you know, and I don't mean to make it difficult for any of us, uh, some latitude in when these citations go out. Um, thankfully, uh, people that I know that had citations uh, had generous neighbors to come out. Uh, and that's about it. I have nothing else to add. Thank you, Dennis. I am going to hop back to the chat. Um, we have a comment from Abby Swain that says, Francisco, Scott, and GM Ang, please coordinate with Brookline DPW to have property owners or the town clear Route 60 bus stops and approaches, including sidewalks and curb cuts along Route 9. Conditions are usually atrocious in part to snow plowed from the street onto the curb and into curb cuts at major intersections for pedestrian traffic like Route 9 and Cypress. Thanks. Jerry, you are next. Thank you. Uh, and this may have uh, come up earlier. I, I joined the meeting late, but um, but what is the, um, do you know, and Andrea, specific to the city, uh, what has the uh, the enforcement been? Have there, do we have any data in terms of how many ticket, tickets go out a season and, and what the, uh, what the uh, response is in terms of whether the fines are paid. I, I just have a concern that maybe it's it's something that's not really enforced. I mean, but you may have talked about it earlier. Like I said, I don't know. No, 
Yeah, thanks, Jerry. Great question. Um, we didn't talk about it earlier, so it's a great question. Um, I will try and pull up the numbers before the end of this meeting, but um, they're actually all public. Um, there's a public data set uh, that lists every um, code enforcement ticket um, that our Public Works Department writes. You can narrow it down by snow and ice violations as opposed to um, things like leaving your trash out uh, too long and, and other violations that code enforcement writes. So we do have that publicly available information. I will try and grab the link before the end of the meeting to share. Um, thank you. Great. Thank you, Jerry and Andrea. Um, I'm quickly going to read some more chat notes. We have a question um, saying, new to the area here, are there organizations that connect people with disabilities slash older adults who need help shoveling with volunteers who are willing to shovel? And we had a response to that question saying, Somerville has a teen snow shoveling program for seniors and homeowners with disabilities. Great to get kids organized and, wonder and working wonderful for our seniors, but excludes residents with disabilities that are tenants. Does anybody else have a program that is more inclusive? So we have that. And if um, other folks have any responses to that, feel free to unmute yourself or add that to the chat. Um, just reading through the rest of them. Um, Nora has a question for you, Andrea. Um, are tickets only issued in response to complaints or is the city proactive about finding unshoveled areas? Both. Um, so the city is proactive. Um, the code enforcement team goes out at the end of the storm um, and they go to every part of the city. Um, they do rely on 311's uh, requests or complaints um, to know if there are particular problem areas or problem properties. Uh, so it, it does help to report it, but they are out writing tickets for anything they see, um, much like uh, parking enforcement folks are like out on the streets wandering to, to write tickets. Um, they also analyze that data at the end of the winter to see if there were particular problem properties so that they can, um, you know, send folks there proactively the next winter that comes around. Thank you for sharing. Um, is there anyone? Sorry, else one other thing I wanted to add on the the ticketing, um, the code violation numbers are written in ordinance, um, but actually a violation of the curb ramp sections are two hundred and fifty dollars violations, not one hundred and fifty. Um, one fifty for the sidewalk, two fifty for a curb ramp violation. Thank you for that information. Is there anybody else who would like to raise any concerns or issues regarding snow removal or other municipal? coordination issues. Tom, go for it. Tom Gilbert again, our tag member, I'm the name plaintiff. Um, I, I, I have a question, um, but this is not exactly in, in relations to snow removal, but it can be uh, if, 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 if these are not rectified, but um, particularly a, a question I wanted to ask to the officials of Medford, why is the, why is the bus stop at at Boston Ave and Holton Street always violated? They, 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 no, no, nobody's bought, ever bothered to put up a zone sign there. There's there's the number sign, but by the mailbox towards the front, but there's no zone sign indicating the the the, the length of the stop. And I've, I've brought it up to transit police. I brought it up to Jennifer at SWA, and um, and it, it never seemed to get rectified. There's always people parking there, and it's always most of the time inaccessible because there's no, you know, since there's no zone sign back back on the, it is a near side stop. So there's no zone sign where it begins. And then all there is, all there is is just the, the sign with the numbers that tells you where it goes to, uh, to, to West Metro on the, nine, on the 94. And why isn't that something that hasn't been rectified yet? I just don't understand. But that's just an example. It goes on in other stops too, but that's just an example I wanted to point out as far as slow responses and and there's nothing new about it. I've, I've brought this up in the past. Holton, H-O-L-T-O-N. Kat, I see you unmuted yourself. Yeah, Tom, I'm going to ask you to repeat that bus stop um, and we will investigate that. The one thing I'll say folks um, in general, and we know, and I know I'm going to take a slightly off topic, so Kat can be back on topic, but we know currently we have a 
significant issue with inaccurate bus stops. And I think over the pandemic, there were a lot of changes to bus routes. One thing that we kicked off earlier this year here at the T is a bus stop audit program. Uh, we've done audits in the past, um, and I think folks are probably familiar with Patty, which is to ensure all of our bus stops are accessible. Um, but this is starting with just making sure we're putting eyes on every single bus stop to make sure there are bus stop signs and the bus stop signs are accurate. That's where we're starting from and then hoping to grow that program out. Um, so with would, that, would, would, for signs on. so if you can, Tom, if you could say that bus stop again, and we'll have someone to go and take a look at it. It's Boston Ave at Holton Street on the outbound on the, on the 94 and the 80. H-O-L-T-O-N, Holton. It's in front of an apartment. Uh, it's 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 not it's, it's not a senior complex. I think it's just a regular uh, apartment, you know, multifamily uh, apartment building, I believe. All right. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Kat. Mm -hmm. Jennifer Smith Workman, you are next. Hi. Um, I've never actually <clears throat> question. I've never actually seen the bus stops being snow being removed, but. <clears throat> Where do they put that snow? Do because it seems that they're throwing it in the streets and the plow trucks are putting it back up on the curb. Uh, do they like with uh, Tom? They have a removal. Do they do that as well with the uh, T removal, the MBTA re snow removal team? Do they just because there are a lot of places where there's no yards for people to throw the snows because you're not supposed to throw it in the street. I just need to know this because it's just awful when you see it cleared and then next to you know it, snow comes again and plows, trucks come. Who, where are they putting the snow? Just that's what I'd like to know. But I think in Somerville they 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 they, they dump it out out in the uh, in the in the DPW yard on near Franey Street. I think there's a snow farm near there. I think where they where they where they put the uh, snow in the dump trucks and then take them to the uh, DPW. Oh. Super yeah. deep, but that's what they're doing. That's great because I don't. Yeah. I think a lot of the, the property owners that are by bus stops, they when they so they don't get fined, they're shoveling the snow into the streets as well, which means that snow is being pushed up to the bus stops. Oh yeah, but yeah, definitely. It's, yep. it's awful. It's awful. It is. Who Thanks, do you report Jen. to? when you see someone doing this uh like a uh, property owner doing something like that i just need to know i'm Does sorry anybody Thanks. have any input on that otherwise i'll move on to the next question this is andrea again if you dump snow from the sidewalk or from private property into the street uh, there is a fine for that as well so again i encourage you to call 311 email them 311 at boston.gov or download the app um, so you can take a picture of the violation. Okay, super duper. Thank you. Thanks, Andrea. Thanks. I am quickly going to read another chat note. Um, we have Francis from the city of Medford who said, I was just wondering why the MBTA and MassDOT do not create a program such as that for ages 13 years to 18 years. Not all municipalities can support this, but it would Think about how great a statewide program would be. The program can be inclusive if we allow the people with lived experience to co-design what meets their needs. Thanks, Francis. Bill Henning, you are next. Hi, thanks. <clears throat> Excuse me, Bill Henning from BCIL. I just want to make a point on one point on snow removal. It's kind of been expressed, but I think the real importance for people with the T or DPWs in the various municipalities as they instruct their workers on snow removal or treating ice, um, just the absolute importance of the nuances and getting it right around access for people with disabilities. Um, our office in Boston is right uh, almost adjacent. Well, there's a Silver Line stop right out our front door and then down another, you know, where people get off the bus and then go down. 80 feet and that's where they get on the bus and a couple times two years ago one time the uh bus stop was immaculately shoveled except that there was a snow bank uh where you would board the bus so as people have said they had to step over the snow bank 
um, you know, was able to call Laura and it got fixed quickly, but not everyone knows to call Laura at SWA to get something fixed. And then about a week later, there was just sheet ice out there, which had to have been there for quite a while. Sheet ice doesn't just appear, it wasn't like a black ice uh, appearance and it had to get it salted. But I, I th you know, the, the crews are tasked with a lot, remove snow, remove it quickly, but the details of snow removal are absolutely vital. Um, another point relative to cooperation with municipalities, it's a little off of the snow issue, but since you put it out there, Kat, I want to respond to it. Um, a lot of you know, not everyone knows, last week there was the um, every six months meeting with Judge Patrick King, the monitor of the settlement of the um, Daniels Feingold lawsuit. And one of the concerns that was raised, and it's been raised a lot, is the matter of elevators in Boston specifically, though it could be anywhere, that um, smell like urine or have human waste in them. And, you know, forever, I, I think, the issue has been directed at the T, but I'll say to my good friend Andrea at the commission, I guess representing the city today, the issue in Boston stems prime, who's, you, you know, we have to think this through. Who is using the elevators as a toilet? People who are out in the street and don't have access to a toilet. Now we work downtown, I'm in early, I'm out late, there's a known existing street population in Boston. It's undeniable. The city addresses it in a multitude of ways. Kudos to the city. But what we're doing is forcing folks living out on the street, unhoused people, the indignity, absolute indignity of using elevators to relieve themselves. And the T keeps getting blamed for this. And it's kind of crazy. People say, oh, the tea didn't clean this. They've ordered technology. But why is it happening? And it happens in very distinct areas. So I would argue we need some cooperation here where the city can think of how to have public restrooms available for people. You know, if you go into South Station every night from 5.30 on, the restrooms, at least the men's room, is uh, an area where a lot of street folks are hanging out. The sinks are being used to clean them. You know, people are taking little mini baths in the sinks, undressing in the stalls, et cetera. It's fine that that happens. I'm not complaining about it. It's giving people a little normalcy, but it sort of reinforces this point. We, you know, there'll be an annual homeless census and we're gonna find out there's X number, a hundred something people out on the streets in Boston. It's a known thing. And I, I think we need some cooperation here to look at that issue that was raised last week and continues to be raised. Or for we're gonna forever have people saying the tea needs to clean it, the tea needs to clean it. But you know, how do you station somebody in the you know right outside there with the disinfectant to clean it so just on the municipal cooperation i i think it's important again it's very indignified situation for the folks out on the street majority i would argue have significant disabilities so it's kind of uh impacting the disability population on two ends there so thank you thanks bill yeah thanks bill and Obviously, uh, I don't have a silver bullet to provide um, our unhoused You're population. You're not in charge maybe. of everything, Andrea. I thought we thought you were. We wished you were. That's what we wished. <laughs> um, but there, I did unmute because there is one thing that uh, the city does have. And again, it's not perfect. It's not going to um, solve everything. But we do have a map. Uh, on our website of publicly available restrooms. Uh, we did a survey a number of years ago with the Age Strong Commission, um, noting the location of public bathrooms, um, including whether or not they have an accessible stall, a family, you know, single stall, uh, all gender stalls, things like that. So uh, I can't pretend that it's a, a perfect list of every single bathroom in the city, um, but I will find it and drop the link in the chat as well. Uh, and we have had more conversations with Age Strong about how can we 
expand this, right? We, we surveyed ones that we sort of know exist, um, but what can we do to potentially create more publicly available bathrooms? Are there ways we can work with property owners, business owners to encourage them to open up otherwise not open um, bathrooms? So uh, right now they're just conversations, so nothing to report on that particular effort. And again, I know this isn't going to solve every single problem, um, even related to T elevators, but I will drop the link in the chat because it is a great resource for folks that are out and about having trouble finding a bathroom. Um, if you need it in a non digital format, feel free to contact our office. Um, I believe Age Strong has some, um, not super easy to skim through, but they do have some paper versions um, that, that I could get folks. Thanks, Andrea. I am going to read a chat comment from Abby. At the risk of seeming radical, I'd like to ask the MBTA and MassDOT to do their best when communicating with staff, contractors, and municipalities to stress that sidewalks are as important rights of way as streets. Sidewalk snow plows should be as common as truck plows. Also, as the climate changes with more fickle freeze slash thaw cycles, we're likely to see more frozen slush that is hard to remove once it forms. So prompt storm response and repeat passes will be needed. Thanks, Abby. Does anybody else have any comments or feedback regarding any municipal coordination issues? Tom, go ahead. Uh, Tom Gilbert again. Uh, uh, our, our tech member. Um, I, 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 I want to bring up a, a, a municipal type coordination that that needs to be done with the T and vice versa. Uh, this is not this isn't, this isn't directly re related to snow removal, but 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 it can be if 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 the uh, if they're not up and and, and they're not available. And, uh, and and what I'm talking about are uh, bus stop signs. Often um, you you have bus stop signs that that, that 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 are knocked down or that are missing, and then they go missing for like days and days and weeks and weeks, and then and they don't get put back up again. And especially during you know when when, when you have snow in the bus stops, and then you just and then you're trying to find out where you're supposed to wait for the stop, and then there's just snow there, and no bus stop sign, and what what are you supposed to do then? Especially for somebody like my friend Reggie and. Myself with, uh, with 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 visual with visual impairments, um, I I I I I um, it always made me wonder why, you know, it's especially since the transit authority has been a transit authority since 1964. 1964, we're almost going on 60 years now, and we still can't figure out who's responsible for what and who's who owns what and who owns. I mean, I'm glad we're getting down to the bottom of it now because you know we got Phil on board and. Some great, great people like that, and but um, my, my one of my ideas I wanted to bring up is that is that is that the T has their of course their main sign shop where they, where they make the bus stop signs for for all sixty two towns and cities uh, within the bus service area. But I also wanted to bring up uh, of, of transportation departments within like uh, Quincy, Braintree, Somerville, Cambridge, Boston, Arlington. All, all these different municipalities have transportation departments, and I just don't understand why that the T just can't supply those transportation departments with route-specific signs. Like, for example, in Somerville, the transportation department in Somerville could have extra T bus stop signs that would, that would only be for the 87, the 88, the 80, the 86, um, possibly a few others within that municipality range and only have those signs with the with the sign uh, ID number and all that. And you know, why can't we get something going like that in, in, in order to promote more efficient uh, sign maintenance to have them put, put right back up as soon as one gets knocked down, it's not going for days and weeks with no bus stop sign available. Thanks, Tom. Joanne, you are next. Hi, um, I'm not sure if all towns have that. I don't know if somebody's here from Braintree, I hope so. Also, but uh, one of the things I wanted to talk about were bus stop changes that were made at the behest of a city or town. Um, there, there have been times when, and I know there's 
a couple here in Braintree and I've seen others elsewhere, uh, bus stops that are actually shortened. Uh, one was shortened in Braintree to the, less than the length of, of a bus. This makes it difficult when there's parking in the area in order for, for a bus to pick up anyway, much less anyone, much less uh, pick up so, nose in and be able to pick up someone who's use, using a wheel mobility device or needs to have the, the ramp for whatever reason. Um, so yeah, it's some, uh, there, there's also, there's a bus stop that was changed, not part of Judge King's um, but bus stop changes. There was one in Quincy that is in, incredibly, it's less than 50 feet away from a corner. And it's a blind corner because the buildings come out fairly far. Um, and people still park in what used to be a parking area. It's dangerous for the buses. Um, it's dangerous for some people. People crossing the street at that area are uh, it's a problem uh, with the buses coming in. Um, there's there's a lot that needs to be hashed out and dealt with, and I'm hoping that all the stakeholders who are present and those who haven't come. Are, can, can see their way through to try to hash out these problems. They're, they're important and I'm hoping they see them this way. Thanks, Kat. Thanks, Joanne. If I could jump in, Kat, real quick on that. Go and and Joanne, if you wanna follow up uh, with either Meg directly or, or with Lauren team, uh, we will absolutely investigate those bus stops. Um, and again, this is, this is something we're really trying to spend more time on because you're absolutely right, it's super important um, we have over 7,500 bus stops in the system. Each one ideally has at least two signs, but not everyone does. Um, but exactly as you say, they're with construction and streetscapes, we're constantly moving, trying to improve. Um, there are temporary closures and placements. So I'd say every, every rating or every quarter, we're probably touching somewhere between 20 to 50 bus stops in coordination with towns. Um, and full credit to Laura's team, uh, we're trying to do a lot more coordination between system-wide accessibility, the cities and towns planning, um, but that doesn't mean we always get it right. Um, so if you find them and, and you see issues, please um, please reach out to us and I'll put my email in the chat if you guys have any questions and we'll happily investigate. Um, though we also know and we're, we're talking to our various DPWs about when construction projects do happen, I know sometimes not everyone's notified and that means sometimes bus stops are temporarily closed. Uh, without us being able to get proper notification. But that, that sounds like a different issue than what you're talking about. This seems like a permanent situation that uh, I would love to uh, take a look at and investigate those bus stops. And oh, yeah. for everyone well, to come in, please let us know. There have been times when there have been, there's been, um, e even if it's for a, a couple of days, um, construction around a bus stop and the T has no notice of it. I don't know why it doesn't really occur to people that this is a bus stop, people use it. Um, we we seem to be the forgotten quite frequently. Um, I, I I never well yeah I do because I talked to Jennifer about it. Um, there, there's an example. I mean not all all the bus stop changes that were made um, by man, by way of the T are great. Um, they move. I I live on a street called Roosevelt Street in senior and disabled housing. I've been here for over 20 years. Uh, Roosevelt Street had a bus stop and the block before us, uh, Main Street, also had a bus stop. They decided to split the difference and put it in between, which would be fine, except Main Street has three houses, actually two, and Roosevelt Street has a complex. Instead of just taking out Main Street and leaving it at Roosevelt Street, what they've done is, like I said, split the difference. Now, the problem is, and this ties into what we're talking about tonight, that means, I mean, the last couple, last few winters, I've had to travel in the street during the snow because people don't shovel their sidewalks. And I don't feel very comfortable. I don't feel very safe driving my chair down Route 37 with traffic behind me and ice on, uh, in, on Route 37. Um, if they would, I had never moved the stop away from, from, uh, Roosevelt Street, it would be a whole lot better for a lot of people who use the bus. I don't get it. I don't understand. But maybe somebody in an office looked, oh, this is a main, this is Main Street. Main Street, like I said, has two houses. 
Um, just, just saying. Um, but I really would like that bus stop moved back to Roosevelt where it was. Thanks, anyway. Joanne. Yeah. Tara, you're next. Hello, everyone. I'm Tara Maddie Doucette, and I'm an attorney with Greater Boston Legal Services and um, counsel for the named plaintiffs in the Daniels Fine Gold Class Action. And here, I'm so glad that you, our named plaintiffs are here and some are on the RTAG executive board. And I have two comments. Uh, the first is, uh, this is such a serious issue. Snow is dangerous, dangerous for everyone and especially dangerous for people with disabilities, people using wheel mobility devices, trying to navigate bus stops. It's so dangerous and such a, was such a critical issue at the time when we were putting together the lawsuit. It'd be, it's a part of the settlement agreement. So it's in there. And coordination with cities and towns, that's in the settlement agreement as well. So I am really super excited when I looked around and I was seeing the different cities represented here. Um, that's fantastic. Um, and I hope like this is not the last time. I hope we, um, you know, Kat's able to pull people together and we continue to have this uh, continued talks and collaboration on how we address the snow removal and all the other issues that uh, people raised here today. Um, regarding what Tom Gilbert said, Tom, you got a lot of nice shout outs, but uh, for the folks in Somerville, Tom used to be in the local media. Part of his big pet peeve was the, sh the snow was so bad that he would go out and shovel it out himself. And he was in the local media. You can Google that, you'll see his articles. And we also have like video of sh Tom shoveling it out for not only for himself, but for the people in his complex and the plate, you know, and people in his community and especially people with disabilities. That shouldn't fall on him, shouldn't have never have fallen on, on Tom. Um, and this, and this, the comment made by Joanne, you know, I can't tell you how painful it was to watch Joanne actually um, in tears tell us about what it felt like to watch, try to go to access her stop. And it was almost as if people were being, as she said, cruel to her. You, you shovel out part of it, but I can't get to it. So that's a real horrible negative impact on a person with a disability, trying just to get from here to there. So this coordination between cities, municipalities, cities, towns, all of you all, MBT and Massachusetts, whoever is here, needs to continue. So that's regarding snow and all of the other issues, you know, bike racks, the things that Joanne and Tom talked about and others. The next thing I would say is what um, Bill Henning spoke about, and it's about the bathrooms. That also is in the settlement. The, the um, elevators being used as bathrooms. Keeping the elevators clean, cleanliness, that's part of the settlement agreement too. These are real legit issues that was decades and decades happening. And kudos to the T because you were trying really hard, even being creative, um, getting the new equipment to send the sensors, to sense urine and all of that. Um, and it didn't kind of work. Um, and it's, it's that, and I agree with Bill, that burden should not fall on the MBTA. It's, it's a shared responsibility. And cities and towns, Boston in particular, you got to own this. You got to own some of this because, for example, the MBTA can identify the, the main culprits, the main elevators. For example, if I were to say to Joanne, Joanne, when you come to my office in Boston, which is the nastiest elevators? And she'll point Valenti Way right there, North Station. Everybody knows they're nasty elevators. So where are the bathrooms in that area, right? So cities and towns need to step up a little bit and do their part. That's all I need to say on this issues, but everything, just about everything you all are saying here about access, bus stop, elevators, it's in that settlement agreement. Thank you. Thanks, Tara. Thanks, Tara. Tom, you are up again. Uh, uh, Tom again. Uh, yeah, I, 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 I wanted to elaborate on what Joanne was talking about earlier in, re in regards to uh, lengths of bus stops and, and, and how lots of times they're, they're, they're never the right length within a lot of municipally uh, in a lot of the stops that are under the, under the municipalities. Like for instance, the, the bus stop in front of me at Western and Broadway, um, I mean, I mean, it's, it's great that DPW takes the snow out of it and all that, and you know, I'm appreciating what DPW does, but this falls more on the transportation department in some of them, not DPW, because DPW just can only do so much as far as what they need to do during the winter and making sure that it, that, that it is clear and everything. but. Um, the stop in front, where, where, where I am is, is, is a near side stop. It's across from Dixon Street. And I would say that that stop is, can't be any more than probably like 40 feet long. 
And, and, and basically what the T specifications are is that at a near side stop, like the one I'm at, needs to be 80 feet, needs to be 80 feet. So, so, so the bus can pull to the curb safely and not have to call what's called diving in, meaning that the front of the nose of the bus has to go to the apex of the curb for, for me to go to board from the sidewalk on, onto the bus directly. And um, the, the, not, not, not only like where, where, where I am, but, but there's a lot of inconsistencies in Somerville and in Arlington and other places where, where this where this goes on. And I think the towns and the cities really need to work with the T and keep good to what uh, on the on the bus stop specifications. If you have 40 foot, 40 foot buses, the near side stops need to be 80 feet. The, the far side stops after the intersection need to be 60 feet and the mid stops need to be yes. 100 feet. I can help you deliver need that. To keep to that. Thanks, Tom. Ralph, go for it. Thank you. Uh, from this uh, work in City Rivera, I'm involved with the Commission of Disability. Just one, one quick comment that I wanted to make. Um, for a lot of these, a lot of these issues that are going on um, with snow removal, not only snow removal but cleaning of these bus stops um, in the communities. One thing that's that I, I believe is falling by the wayside, and a lot of people don't realize that cities and towns pay the MBTA to have these services in their cities and towns. So we we pay the MBTA to have these routes in our cities and towns. So when people say that it needs to fall on the cities and towns to do more, I, I'm sorry, but I don't think it, it, it really does. Yeah, we can do some of our part, but the cities and towns pay for these routes to be part of services in these cities and towns. So the MBTA really does need to take a lot more responsibility. Uh, I, I know in, in the city of Revere, um, we we still have bus stops that don't have shelters. So that is a big concern in the winter time. Um, there's some there's some places that still don't have bus shelters. So that is very uh, unaccommodating for for not only people with disabilities but for people of all abilities, um, especially in the winter time. So that's that's another aspect of this whole thing. Thanks for sharing, Ralph. Joanne, go for it. Um, the gentleman who just spoke, um, you, you saw a picture of the bus shelter um, across the street from where the, there was no shelter. There's only a handful of shelters here in Braintree. And um, it's not as wealthy a community as it used to be. There are many more people who are using the bus since it was, there were 20 years ago. However, the cities and towns may pay for the bus routes to be in their cities and towns. However, those things are for the convenience of your residents, the people who pay taxes, the ones who need the bus routes. So yeah, this is a cooperative thing. This is not, uh, the T's not blaming anybody. This is a matter of, we need, we need your, the, the people in your cities and towns, your Revere need to be able to get to the buses. What good is it if there are bus stops that they can't get to? Where is, you know, the well over, what is it, almost 200 cities and towns? I have no idea how many bus stops there are. I know it's written down somewhere. But how on earth, how on earth is the T supposed to take care of every single city and town? Look around Boston. There are not bus shelters everywhere. And it's not just cities and towns. There are bus routes going through other stakeholders or properties, through universities and colleges, through uh, financial financial uh, company uh, parks, through lots of places that have nothing to do with with municipalities. But you are your people in Revere are dependent on the transportation. So don't, don't get it twisted. They're the Thanks. ones who are depending on it. That's all I have to say. Thanks, Joanne. All right, folks, do we have any other comments or feedback or concerns or questions? I am happy to also provide space for 
any representatives from the MBTA or mascot to say any final words? All right, Tom, go for it quickly before we see if anyone else wants to hop in. Okay, real, real quickly. Um, I, I, I have a question. Um, with, with some of the bus stop uh, changes, particularly um, on the 89 on Broadway and also the one near Leachmere, um, I, I, I think the, before they, 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 they move bus stops, I think they need or move them or re-augment them they need to get more feedback from, from, from us because uh, particularly the one on Broadway at Illinois Street on the outbound side and Glen Street on the inbound side when you go into Sullivan Station. Now the Glen Street side is fine because they they turned that into a, from a far side into a near side to a far side stop so, so, so the bus can go beyond the intersection and pull to the curb fine that way. The problem is, is on the Illinois side the Illinois Street side is, is is why they moved it from Michigan Avenue. We have to like walk a block up or so to, to, to then get to the outbound side, of it, which makes no sense to me. You, you should be able to go from the inbound side of the bus stop, cross the intersection and be right on the other side and then meet up with the bus stop that's either on the near side or the far side of that same intersection. And that and, that, and that's not happening at the one at that particular one there. And then the one near Leachmere, uh, the bus stop was formerly in front of a um, Twin City Plaza, which is a shopping center, which which spells goes off, okay, ADA stop, which means it's near a shopping center. But instead, that was moved out, down towards a, a floating stop towards Leachmere, which again, d d does not meet up with the outbound side of Twin City Plaza when you want to go back the other way. There's no crosswalk there to then cross over uh, and then immediately meet up with the uh, outbound side there. So... I, I I don't understand what the rationale was there because I kept asking different people. Are there, is is there a a senior complex in that area? Or why that clothing stop was there? If not, why not just put it back to Twin City Plaza where it originally was? Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Um, I'm. Oh yeah, go for it, Cap. Oh no no no! I'll, I'll be quick here, and I know I think Tom has came up last week too. And Tom, I, I always I always appreciate and love your feedback and thoughts. Thank you. Um, sure. I think. So to, without getting into the details, and I think Melissa spoke about delay, our senior director of planning and scheduling talked about the Twin City one in particular. Um, it's fundamentally, there's not enough space to have the right-hand turn and accessible bus stop, which is why it was moved further down. Uh, but we are still working, it's a MassDOT project, and MassDOT's still working on a number of additional roadway improvements to make that bus stop more visible and safer. Um, but generally, and this is where I was trying to get to, we are, it is one thing we're trying to do every day to get better at is the collaboration with the cities and towns. And there's a whole suite of factors that go into a bus stop move. Um, uh, driver safety, you talk about the near side, far side. Um, we recognize that bus stops are fundamentally sometimes political and we're working through with the, with the concerns that the butters might have. Um, making sure that any bus stop we create is a fully accessible bus stop. Um, and so we're also taking into consideration the sidewalk condition. Um, so there's a whole bunch of factors about why bus stops may be moved and why they're moved, where they are moved. Uh, we also look obviously at riderships and on and off. So any one bus stop, I, I don't know the one on Broadway in Illinois and why it's there versus the other one, but there, there's a broad of factors. And again, my email is in the chat and I'm happy to, to follow up with folks if folks have specific questions about why bus stops may have been moved or why they have not been moved. Um, and then generally also, we are generally trying to improve spacing on bus stops as well. Um, but there's yeah, I also wanted to say too that 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 where it's at the uh, floating stop now, I, I just think it puts an undue burden as far as if anybody wants to go to the shopping center, they have to cross now they have to cross through that intersection where the McDonald's is and all and this and that. it's it's quite a long ways from the from the floating stop to to actually get back to the back to the shopping center uh, of where the star market is because it used to be when it, pulled to the uh, right at Twin City Plaza. It wasn't a long walk to the path that actually went into the shopping center itself. You see, you were practically right there. And that now it's like way down on this floating stop now. And then again, you can also immediately can't turn around on the outbound side immediately because there's no crosswalk there from the floating stop in order to like wait for the stop bus on the other side to then immediately go back on the outbound. And this, this is what 
I, I'm having trouble with the rationale behind all this because if they could could have just maybe worked harder more on, on optimizing the Twin City Plaza and make that safer rather than putting the floating one there. I guess that's what I'm, what I'm trying to say, I guess. Thanks, Tom. Thanks. All right, I am going to read one last chat note and then I will pass it on to anybody who wants to give final comments from the MBTA and MassDOT. Abby shared, as long as we're talking about bus stop markings or marking stops on streets, some of them aren't wide enough either. So buses can't pull up next to the curb if vehicles are present in the adjacent travel lane. The 2018 MBTA bus stop guidelines specify eight foot width but Melissa Delea, MBTA Senior Director for Service Planning, says that the MBTA is working on updating those standards to 10 feet in a parking lane and 11 feet in a travel lane. Municipalities should get that tip ASAP since they're building stops that are too narrow. They're trying to fit a lot into the street, including bike lanes. Right. Thanks, Abby. All right. Kat, if Laura. I could say one last oh. thing on behalf of the city, if that's all right. Yes, city absolutely. <laughs> Go for it. Um, at the risk of sounding like a broken record, I just want to say 311. If you see unshoveled sidewalks, if you see unshoveled curb ramps, uh, you can absolutely call 311. Uh, if you have the app, I highly encourage you to download that. If you are a person who uses apps at all, because snapping a picture can be super helpful um, to the code enforcement person that will follow up on your request. Um, so you don't have to figure out who's responsible for that sidewalk or that curb ramp. The city will, if it's a private property owner, a commercial. Um, we've written tickets against ourselves. The Public Works Department will write a ticket against the Parks Department if they don't shovel the sidewalk um, that abuts the sidewalk. Um, if it's a sidewalk that abuts a you know, big commercial property or the T or ourselves, you know, we'll figure out who that person is so that we can do that coordination um, to get it cleared. So through on one is a great friend uh, in the winter months. Um, so if you have any questions, uh, you can always email them as well, 311 at boston.gov. Thanks everyone. Thanks, Andrea. Just quick question for you, a follow-up question. Has there ever been a campaign or like marketing campaign surrounding 311 at all to get that education awareness about 311 out there for folks? Yeah. Um, so I don't know if there's been one dedicated campaign, uh, but I know that every single uh, public information officer so every department in the city has a public information officer. And whenever we're talking to constituents, you know, we uh, mentioned 311. I think we have like actually even bus shelter ads up on some MBTA bus shelters saying like sort of a see something, say something type message of um, of what you want. It, it used to be called like the mayor's something line, I think. So some people may know it by that. Um, but 311 uh, is your direct connection to City Hall. Um, so not just for the winter. If you think you aren't sure who in the city you need to talk to, we have 24-7, 365 call takers uh, who will direct your call to the appropriate department. Great. Thank you so much. Laura and GM Ang, I see you both unmuted and uh, are showing yourself on the screen. I'm going to pass it over to you for final comments. That was good. GM, would, like you, would you like to say the closing remarks? Well, you can say some as well. I just want to thank everybody. I know how busy uh, during um, every day's um, life, as well as this time of year, it is for folks. But this has been an invaluable opportunity for myself. And I thank my team uh, for being here as well to get direct feedback. Uh, I know we have a lot of work to do, but I also know the spirit of partnership and communication um, will enable us to help do better. I'd like to thank all the municipalities for their support and participation as well. Um, this is truly, from my perspective, um, it, it's a great opportunity for me to hear directly. And I just want everyone to know a commitment that we have at the T to continuing to work on all of these things. Some of them today were very specific, which is good. And some are a lot uh, bigger picture, which we do know that we will continue to drive towards those solutions. Uh, but I want to say thank you to everyone. And I want to wish everyone a very happy and safe holiday season. Thanks, GM. The only thing I would add to that is just a heads up for everyone. We are actually going to be sitting down with uh, the Archive Executive Board and the name plaintiffs in January. 
to discuss a draft municipal communication and collaboration plan. Um, and I expect after that conversation, uh, we will want to, we will be asking to present at an RTEC general meeting to get additional feedback from the public. So uh, stay tuned for that. Thanks everybody. All right. Thank you, everybody. I am just going to say some final notes. Um, I want to thank all of the community members who showed up tonight, um, MBTA, MassDOT, and municipality reps who were able to make it. Um, as we clearly heard tonight, there are significant challenges that riders experience related to snow and ice throughout our system. Um, so we continue as a group to ask the MBTA, MassDOT, and municipalities to work together to maximize accessibility and safety of the public and allow people with disabilities and older adults to be fully participating members in our community. Um, and a couple of specific things we touched upon um, was re revisiting the city's ordinances to include bus stops um, and also just educating property owners about the responsibility of shoveling as well as visiting um, concerns regarding shortened bus stops and public restrooms. Um, so thank you everybody for attending. We will definitely continue this conversation. Um, if you're interested in getting involved with RTAG and some of our working groups, feel free to reach out to us. Um, otherwise we will see you next month and I hope you have a very happy holiday. Thank you, happy holidays. Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.